start a fresh recording. So in today's session, uh, I actually wanted to, to address three major needs. Needs without which I, I wouldn't feel I've done justice to kind of rounding out this course. First of all, I, I wanna tell you about a set of material I had aspirations to cover, but where we just didn't have the time to do it. Um, some of the lectures ended up taking more than one session. And in the end, there were of necessity some opportunity costs for that. There's some material we couldn't cover. So first I wanna, I wanna talk about some topics that I, I didn't get to, although I really wanted to do so. And I, I do so partly because you can find videos of me talking about those topics uh, for, for many of them, but also because they bear, they bear thought. Um, there's actually some fairly important material in there. And I'm, I'm hoping to refer you in some cases to a literature that you may not have known existed on these topics. Um, give you resources, my videos, but but also from the literature. Um, some of these are have some resonance within agent-based modeling more generally, and it's worth uh, encountering them. So that's one topic. It's, it's just to sort of briefly look at some material I would have loved to have covered. Uh, secondly, I wanted to talk, oh, that's interesting. Um, I, I see, I see there's, there's sound from elsewhere in the room. Um, secondly, I wanted to cover some frontiers in agent-based modeling. Um, and this reflects the fact that agent-based modeling is advancing. Uh, I expect it to advance a lot more in the next 10 years than it has in the past 30. And, and then in the past 40, um, most of which I've been using it. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to, to highlight some major areas where I see advances being made and being needed. These are areas where in many cases, my group is seeking to contribute. But, it also includes other areas where others are contributing as well um, or alongside our group. So, um, uh, you know, I, I wanna highlight these to you. Um, and one of the reasons for that is the um, needs or the requirements of agent-based modeling are changing over time. Um, just as the requirements for conducting machine learning algorithms have changed a lot in the past 30 years since I started applying them. The, the language is to support them. You no longer have to you know, code, code it up in C or what have you. You can use R, you can use Python and, and conduct high level machine learning out analyses. Agent-based modeling is evolving in a similar way. And there's some good features and some bad. And I wanted to address those. Um, thirdly, though, beyond these kind of frontiers in agent-based modeling, I wanted to, to clue you into some additional opportunities kind of looking forward. Um, and that's the part I, I didn't do full justice to, um, but uh, I'll speak about that uh, a little bit at least and, and try to provide you some additional resources uh, uh, at a later point as well. Okay, so uh, just as a reminder, uh, I will be accepting course projects through the 20th. Um, you know, I uh, am glad to help the teams achieve the potential of their methods. And one of the best ways you can do that is by attending office hours or by writing me and we can set up a, a separate meeting. I recognize many of you are really at the rubber meets the road stage now, and I'm glad to, to try to assist that, okay? Um, okay, so let's switch over 
now to, to slides and we'll get going. Oh, okay. Okay, so I called this frontiers and nature-based modeling, but it, it's really an amalgam of, of those things. And first thing per my comments that I wanted to address is a set of topics not reached. Um, the first of these is I really wanted to deliver a talk specifically in a really textured way, in a thoughtful way, um, about the intersection between ABM and health equity. And I believe there's a profound connection here. Um, and there's words of caution and words of opportunity for, for how these methods can be used to address health equity concerns in modeling, can, can explicitly target health equity priorities. And having worked in this area for a great deal of time, there's also some common misunderstandings that people have that modelers bring to the table. Um, for example, about it just being a matter of distinguishing people of a certain type in the model. Um, or capturing varying parameter values. And, and there's some reasons that one has to be more, it, it really is important to be more thoughtful than that, um, to them to just treat it as a heterogeneous population. Um, there's some reasons to go upstream in your representation, to represent factors involved in the social determinants of health, for example. Um, uh, barriers involved in, in, in health equity that can be addressed, things like housing, um, uh, barriers associated with education or transportation, um, uh, access to care, uh, limitations of geography, et cetera, um, stigma, um, language barriers at some levels, et cetera. Uh, I'm determined to give this lecture and the fact that I've been given it in this class uh, pains me. It, it actually really is a point of foremost regret. So I, I'm convinced I'm gonna give it sometime in the next month and I'll let everyone know when I'm gonna give it. And if you'd like to attend, that's great. If you don't, I'll record it and I'll add it to the class site. But I don't feel the class is complete without that. And um, I look forward to, to sharing my thoughts here, some of which are assembled. Now, a second topic, uh, quite distinct from the first, to be sure, has to do with representing perception and action, choices, behavior in agent-based models. And there's a long, proud, and rich tradition in agent-based modeling of using agent-based models to capture um, quite compelling pictures of collective behavior. Um, a classic example of which is flocking behavior or behavior like when you see schools of fish swimming around, you know, following each other um, in sort of a sinuous wave or birds migrating south in, in patterns. Um, those sort of patterns are in the world around us. They're in people behavior as well. And it turns out that agent-based models have long been used to examine these issues of agent-to-agent -agent interaction and to examine this emergent behavior that comes out for the flock or the school or shoal of fish, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, here I, I, I really want to expose you to some of those models. Now, fortunately, if you get any logics example models, you'll find a, a model called Boyd's, I think, or flock of Boyd's, which shows some of that flocking behavior um, uh, in a very visual way. But beyond that, I want to showcase some models that are often termed opinion dynamics models. These are uh, models that characterize spread of ideas or norms or opinions, um, and often what follows from that is behavior. So it might be attitudes towards smoking, 
or at attitudes towards modern vigorous physical activity or sedentary behavior or dietary dietary behavior or you know uh, study or what have you um and there's some really interesting models that have been formulated here um of quite varied sorts but um many of them capture this fact that a given person's attitudes are some function of those around them and if there's more people around them with a certain attitude that that at least is reason not too far from that person that person's attitudes are likely to be influenced by that so it's kind of a, a diffusion of ideas and there's kind of a gravitation where my attitudes might be shaped by those in my social network maybe online maybe in person and my behaviors might follow so there's there's some great work there in this whole opinion dynamics literature has many variant models. Um, my student Arjun Shurjati is has uh, helpfully catalogs something like nine different types of uh, varieties of these models. Um, so that that too is worth uh, being aware of. Um, forgive forgive my lapse in English. Um, now beyond this, beyond these sort of issues of shaping opinion attitude belief sometimes um there's models of behavior how people make decisions under uncertainty and under a variety of conditions involving trade-offs in the world formal models for this and there's some once again, a very powerful literature um, that comes from uh, the quarter of random utility theory and discrete choice theory of deliberative decision making. But then there's some provocative literature from the psychological literature that demonstrates two types of decision making. One, more deliberative decision making where someone weighs the trade-offs on the one hand and the other decision making that's fast and heuristic and and just sort of um uh you you've got to make a decision very very quickly about what to do thing and often you use heuristics and Kahneman and Tversky are probably the most prominent um prominent exponents of this idea. Thinking Fast and Slow is the title of one of their books. And they articulate these two types of thinking, which they argue govern different types of human behavior in different circumstances. Uh, and both are very important types of, of, of decision-making that play a role in health behaviors as well as other factors. But it turns out that whether it's discrete choice theory or with more work, these, these different types of behavior, you know, we can work to incorporate them quite successfully in agent-based models. And, and that can lead to agent-based models that are principled and in, in, in some cases, as my student Kurt Kruger has demonstrated, you can take measured data from the world using controlled experiments conducted through, say, best worst scaling, a technique from the random utility theory literature on surveys. And you can basically estimate parameter values that you can plug into a decision making model on the part of agents to capture different ways agents make decisions and the different preferences they have for different trade offs um trade-offs that might involve risk or might involve price or might involve time or might involve inconvenience and so on that might affect their 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 health behavior so there's some some really nice literature here and if anyone's interested in you know em empirically grounded estimation of how agent you know, how people in the world make decisions and by extension representing that in agents, I'd be glad to, to speak to you. Now, 
quite different issues are involve um, uh, a set of sort of technical concerns with the pragmatics of modeling, computational cost. Um, I'll, I'll actually allude to some of these later um, and talk about progress in agent-based modeling and prospects for it. But agent-based models has high, have high costs because there's a lot going on in a given model run, a lot of moving parts. And because you have to run it often many times to build up enough statistical data to recognize the regularities in output, to make sure you're not just viewing a fluke of a run. So models have high computational costs, costs in terms of time, costs in terms of memory. And, um, and there are certain things like sending lots of messages or like having events going off very, very frequently that will really bog a model down. And there's ways to kind of finesse that and make it less of a burden. So if you want to understand why your model is running very, very slow, um, you know, there's some rules of thumb there, um, including about problems with hybrid modeling. So um, I, I wanted to, to cover that, and you will find videos of me lecturing on that from this past August as part of my boot camp. Model debugging is another big issue. Now, um, this, this is a reflection of, of two things. One thing sort of prosaic, but, but notable. And the other thing a little bit deeper. With debugging, agent-based models are computational artifacts. They are, they are computer programs. computational models. And as any computer program, there can be problems in it. And some of those problems, problems in implementation of it, where we make a dumb mistake, like we put times instead of plus or something like that, or we're off by one in some calculation, well, we'll call a bug, a bug, it's a bug. And it will lead the model to do weird things. And we want to track down that defect, the underlying defect based on observed model behavior that's strange. The, the, it's, so we have the underlying defect and then we have this observed anomalous behavior, which we might term a failure when it, when it causes something really obvious. And it turns out that the tracking those problems down, and as with any program, takes some um, sleuthing. And, and there's techniques to do this a lot faster. Um, if you look at programmers out there, they can differ by an order of magnitude, factor of 10 or 20, and how quickly they can find defects in, in system. Um, and there's, it's, not a, it's not a matter of, of luck. It's a matter of pursuing it in a regular way based on hypotheses, particularly. It's, it's a particularly effective method. So debugging models is hard because they're computer programs, and debugging computer programs takes effort, and, and you got to apply the same effort with a model. That's kind of the prosaic level. But at a deeper level, when we're dealing with agent-based models, often we have behavior that's surprising or unexpected, not because it's a bug, but because it's emergent patterns from the model. We run the model to learn. We run the model to see a emergent behavior that we can't predict up front. And sometimes determining from weird behavior, whether it's a defect, a defect in implementation, a defect in design of the model, a defect in implementation is like, you didn't build the model right. You didn't, you didn't build it up properly. You, you meant this and you actually did something different when you, you put a plus instead of a top. So you meant to do it right, but you don't. And then there's this other level of 
did you build the right model? Maybe the design of the model was screwy and you didn't realize it until you see it running and oh yeah, yeah, of course I can't do it that way. I need some sort of mechanism to allow the population to stabilize. Uh, otherwise it's just gonna grow without limit or whatever. So the question there is, did I build the model? Did I build the right model? But, you know, sometimes um, when we see complex behavior, we can't tell if it's a bug or not. We, we can't tell maybe it's emergent behavior. Maybe it's just interesting worthwhile behavior. So, so that can be some of the most valuable things to get out of a model, emergent behavior. But at the same time, it's a bug. We, we don't want to really dignify it by spending that much time with it. If it's a bug, we want to fix it and get on and, and run the fixed model. And so with modeling, there's this kind of going back and forth. Is this a bug or is it emergence? Is this gold or is it fool's gold? Is it a problem? Um, and, and there's an extra poignancy with it. And there's ways to do this really well. Um, so well, that's a topic on and on, on itself. Placing ABMs within processing pipelines as components of a larger analysis scheme is another topic I was hoping to talk about. I'll return to it later and talk about future of AB ABM. So I won't talk about it much now, but a lot of the time we use ABMs, we produce data from them that is then analyzed further. And often before we get to the ABM, we analyze data statistically or, or with machine learning methods or with other techniques. We gather data, we slice and dice it, and some of it goes into our model. So often they're in a pipeline. There's things before the model, we run the model, and then there's things after we run the model that we do. And, and being conscious of that can be helpful, can help you design your model um, more effectively. Um, I was also going to talk about categories of emergence. There's different depths of emergence, weak emergence, strong emergence. Um, that's more of a conceptual topic. And then there's some best practices involving ABM process and involving technical issues. And you'll find me talking about those some in videos as well. Okay, now, now I'm on to frontiers and agent-based modeling in its real form. These are topics not reached with some regret, and yet you will find me talking on most of these online, and I will be talking on the first of them. I'm going to put together something in the next few weeks that's complete. Okay, but let's talk about frontiers. So, so I first encountered agent-based modeling and did some significant exploration of agent-based modeling in the mid 80s. That's 1980s for those youngins out there. Eh? Um, uh, and a lot of time has passed. Uh, I've gone through a lot of pairs of shoes since then. Um, but there's actually been less advance in the tools than I would like. If I thought, when, when I started using ABMs for serious research in 1990, if I thought that we'd be where we are today with the software, I, I would have been shocked, honestly. I would have been shocked. As a computer scientist, I'm ashamed by where we're at. I think today's, today's software, today's um, support for agent-based modeling is, is really subpar. Um, it has some points of strength. It's going the, in some good directions, but there's some retrograde components and it needs to do a lot better. It can do a lot better. That's the main thing. There's this big gap between what could be and what is. And it troubles me greatly. Sometimes it comes close to making me sick to my stomach. Um, and, and current ABM practice has just huge potential. And I, I hope in this class, if nothing, I've communicated some of the potential for agent-based modeling to really, really play key roles in, in health. And increasingly it does in practice, but at great expense. 
really the current status of agent-based modeling is needlessly encumbered by a set of problems. And I sort of listed them out here in, in sort of a, um, a set of, set of uh, points of shame. Um, you know, it's, it's opaque. It's often opaque to decision makers if you're not careful with your model, if you're putting code in, in there, it's, it, it can be hard for them to understand what's there. It can be hard for other team members. It can be hard for yourself in the future to sometimes reason about what the logic is if you're not careful. Um, uh, it can be obscure and often the implementation of the model, how you go about implementing gets in the way of understanding what is going on at a high level. In any logic, you know, things are scattered all around. Um, and net logo, there, there may be a bunch of net logo code that's there and somehow you have to see through it and see the, the high level picture of the model design. Um, same thing, if, you know, C++ or Java code for repass or for mod gen, a variant of C++. It also tends to be uh, monolithic. So you have these models that are kind of single pieces and not really, um, not really effectively composed of, of, of many modular components. It tends to be error prone. It's easy to make mistakes in, in, uh, in, in code, um, it's entangled. So within your model, often you have woven together some things with model output and things with model logic and things with visualization and things with scenarios and interventions. And they're kind of tangled together in a, in a troublingly promiscuous way. I mean, it's, it's really, it, it really is quite um, uh, quite quite a hairball sometimes. They, they can become entangled with each other. And again, it becomes hard to see the forest because of the trees. Um, there's just so much stuff in the way that you wanna, you wanna really see, okay, what's the structure of the model? And you have all this stuff with visualization or with output in the way or with undertaking interventions. It's, it's kind of annoying. It tends to be more rigid than, than I would like, uh, can't evolve quite as quickly because models become very cumbersome after a while as they get built up uh, and get accreted more and more components. It tends to have a single user focus for its software, uh, be unfortunately slow, uh, net logo, any logic, um, and re regular repast. I mean, they, they, they don't scale very well. Um, uh, any logic, you know, we can get 1.2 million population for Saskatchewan, but only if we throw massive amounts of computer power, you know, a really powerful machine on it and run it for a while. Um, and I mean, this is the 2020s. If I had known this, like in 1990, when I started doing serious research-based ABM, I, again, I would have been shocked. Like, come on, we massive computation and, and and it's hard to run a model above, you know, uh, tens of thousands of agents in, in that logo. I mean, that's that's kind of pathetic. Uh, and it, it tends to be fairly poorly scalable for really large populations right now. Now, that's the bad news. That's the ugly side. This is this is the you heard for most of the class the good. This is the bad and the ugly of agent-based modeling. Um, I. I'm ashamed. I, I think we can do so much better. And the good news is, uh, the, the good news in response is that there's actually a lot we can do better. Um, these are problems, but they're unnecessary problems. That's the thing. They're needless problems. We know how to do better. I'm a computer scientist. I know how to do this better. I mean, 30 years ago, I, I had basic ideas for, for many of these things. And it's a shock to me that people haven't done, haven't undertaken them. So there's a number of frontiers that can help address this. Um, there's a set of techniques that can really point us towards models that are much more transparent, modular, and flexible. 
including for hybrid, uh, hybrid EVMs, and in general, better support for a hybrid and multi scale model. Um, there are some great opportunities for tying ABMs together with big data and data pipelines in a way that's quite important in modern practice. And uh, that can bring together ABMs with machine learning in a way that's also very valuable. There's performance optimization that can be used to really speed up models effectively, particularly if they can be analyzed effectively, uh, if they have structure that's clear. And, and there's uh, techniques for rigorous scale modeling that I won't have time to get into, but basically can allow you to experiment with a small population, let's say 30,000, and say, what would the results be for a larger population, say 30 million? Um, it's not just multiplying by 1,000, 30,000 to 30 million. It's, it's not just multiplied by 1,000. No, 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 no. I mean, if, it's, if you look at a fractional prevalence, obviously you, you might anticipate you know, a fractional prevalence that's kind of similar for 30 million. If you're looking at a count of people infected over time, you would have to scale up linearly, but it's not always linear. Sometimes it's it's by certain powers of, of certain ratios, et cetera. And there's some techniques for, for improving that uh, or for conducting that really, really rigorously. Um, there are techniques for characterizing decision-making of situated agents that we can support in our agent-based modeling really well. And innovations in agent-based modeling process that can really help us um, going forward, uh, uh, help, help bring people with lived experience to our process, help, help engage with stakeholders more effectively through use of model maps. And finally, techniques by which we can support teams much more effectively. So we move beyond this kind of single user focus. So a lot of these, the large majority uh, can, be, can be readily addressed. This, these are needless encumbrances, not necessary ones. And as the time allows, I'd, I'd like to kind of go through these. Um, so, the first is, a, is an area in which we're doing a lot of work now, and I'll have to restrain my enthusiasm, but basically it's aimed at creating transparent, declarative ABMs, ABMs where the formal code in an R sense or a Python sense or a sense of Java is minimized. Um, and it's... Uh, it, it allows for a, a specification of an ABM that describes what you want to build and less the details of exactly how. And it supports modular ABMs. Now, these techniques are based on something called category theory. And, and I'm, I'm uh, very, uh, very excited by many of the components here. But a lot of it involves separating out syntax from semantics of models, syntax being kind of the form of the model on the one hand from kind of the interpretation of the model on the other. And it turns out with the form of the model, we can specify them in ways using techniques known as, as uh, uh, domain specific languages or, or, or grammars of sort. We can specify ABMs in ways that are a lot clearer than just a set of code. Um, and any logic gives you some sense of that with things like state charts or things like events where you know, you're, you're more focused on the what and less on the how. Stocks and flows have that, uh, have that, set, that feel as well. Beyond these things though, um, you could support compositional agent-based models so where you can stick them together. That's part of the goal here. Um, and you're characterizing rules by what they accomplish rather than the details of, of how they, they carry it out. And you're looking for something that's computational transparent so that the rules are data, like what the model itself is characterized not as code, but as data. 
and that allows you to reason about it and the software to speed it up um, by recognizing that certain things can be can be done very quickly in, in certain better ways. Um, and uh, you can incorporate things like dimensional information. So the idea is, you know, you should be able to specify something like rules that say, hey, look, if I have within a given setting, let's say it's a home, I have two agents, one of which is susceptible, one of which is infective, with a certain rate, say 0.5 per day, um, they will turn into those agents uh, will evolve in a way that the susceptible one becomes infected. It transitions from the S to the I. Um, and there might be another rule that's specified where you know you say that some that an agent wherever they are, who's infective, regardless of their environment, will recover with a rate of 0.1 per day. So on average, 10 days, they'll, they'll recover. Now, this may seem very cartoonish, but the point is to bring rules out of the realm of arbitrary code, which is not something computers can, they can run it, but they can't easily understand its structure and take advantage of that structure and instead characterize the rules in a way that's visually transparent and that is data. And by so doing, it can be optimized. It can be, you can, you can take advantage of a structure, reason about it, and reason about how to do it much faster, how to parallelize it, run it on GPUs or, or put it on multiple processors even running across multiple machines. So the idea is by representing the rules of an ABM, not as code, but in a graphical, in a, in a way that is amenable to graphical depiction, but in a way that's amenable to the clear declarative specification, specifying what the rule is, um, rather than specifying the code that makes the rule happen, you can, secure a bunch of advantages. And one of them is the model becomes more transparent. Any logic has tried to capture this, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that I've really pushed them on this over the years through, through things like state charts and other packages of followed suit. Um, so for example, Repast has, has um, uh, drawn on state charts as well. And for good reason, they, they provide a way of sort of indicating state actions and rules at once, but there's a lot more we can do to characterize rules for evolution of models without, in a way that minimizes the need for arbitrary code. Um, now beyond this, beyond model specification, there's model semantics. And, and here it's a matter of interpreting a model differently. And the idea is we'd like to be able to have a given model that can be interpreted by different stakeholders with different needs, with through different lenses. And, and where a given model might be used for calibration on the one hand, or used for sensitivity analysis on the other, or regular run on the other, or particle filtering on the other, or extraction of high level structure on the other, um, in a very ready way. And so you're separating out what the model has an observer processes, what data is collected when it runs, what's visual, what visualization is being shown from the underlying model logic. The syntax captures the model structure and logic, and the semantics allows you to interpret it with different lenses where you see different types of information. And it turns out by so doing, you can extract information on high level constructs. So some people here will know that for years we've experimented with high level depictions of agent-based model logic. And the idea is to, to have a mechanism that, that can allow you to discuss what needs to be in a model before you build it, but also to have a way of kind of sketching out a model that you can talk about at other times that keeps current with the model. And we had a number of languages that we experimented with. This is joint work with Jeff McDonald from uh, Sydney, Australia, and um, where we tried to represent 
factors like within an agent versus things in the environment, geographic components, aspects of groups and connections, et cetera. And we actually had a tool we, we built up and deployed and it was a interactive tool for, for drawing out these maps. Um, and uh, the goal was to try to extract um, these high level components from models. So when we say coarse graining ma mapping of models to more abstract descriptions, we're taking a model, we're representing in this higher level fashion, which can be amenable for, for discussion. Beyond that though, we look to build up models out of more high level pieces, more high level building blocks. We've already seen stocks and flows and state charts, which are a great step in this direction. But you know, we need more. We need things like biographies for agents or to be able to layer on some sort of representation of statistics that should be computed across the population in a way that's cross-tabulated, broken down by different ways and, and compute different breakdowns uh, according to your specification of certain information be collected, certain predicates about who it should be collected on and a certain breakdown of it, a certain tabulation of it. Um, high level things to represent norm spread or opinion spread, um, to calculate flow statistics, what the incidents between last week and this week. Those who attended my session showing building up a model know that I engineered that in, you know, very explicitly that we shouldn't have to do that. We should be able to get the software to sort of just support collection of, you know, how many new people have gotten infected in the last week, basically, and and know how to do that as a as a high level construct. Um, and things like service seeking, uh, activity-based costing was something I showed as well, where you can have costs for different states an agent could be in, and maybe quality of life. They should be able to represent that. And there are some things like concerns and conditions that are really reflecting the fact that often in our models right now, and you get this sense very much in any logic, uh, but the same thing is true for for other extant platforms, including that logo. Sometimes if you're dealing with a given concern, maybe it's a cardiac concern, maybe it's diabetes, maybe it's um, COVID-19, you'll often have many pieces of the model of different sorts associated with that same concern. So you have some code for them getting it and some code for being treated for it and some code being diagnosed for it maybe. Then you have some output showing the number of people who have recently, you know, the incident cases, people who have been diagnosed with it. And then another one showing the prevalent cases and all those conceptually, all the statistics and the outputs and the data collected and history information about when they got diabetes and the state charts or, or other logic for it. It's all related to this concern, but it's all scattered around the model. And the idea behind these concerns is to kind of capture them together, have them in one place. So you, you have a, in the model, you know, this is diabetes related stuff, that is COVID-19 stuff, that is influenza stuff. And it groups all those different components. That, those cross-cutting components are currently unfortunately lost. And that's part of the entangling. It's just all this stuff related conceptually to say COVID-19, but it's at many places. And all this stuff related to diabetes in many different places and statistics and output and, you know, in file output and visual output on graphs and state charts and messages and counts and, and information being stored in variables, et cetera. So we have a lot of high level things we can add to our model to build them up out of higher level pieces and to capture the relationship between those pieces. Because much of what makes agent-based modeling hard is you have these pieces and maybe you understand what each piece does, but the question is what pieces are needed and how do they have to be wired up to each other? That's what makes a lot of agent-based modeling hard right now. It's 
how do I wire these pieces up to each other to achieve my goal? So um, this is, these are some of the things we're hoping to address over time in our work and others have worked to, to try to address components of it. And I, I do give credit for any logic for, for trying early on to address many of, of these challenges. Um, hybrid modeling, I've spoken about the, the value of hybrid modeling. Um, and uh, I'm a big believer in the epistemic advantages of hybrid modeling, that it helps learning and more learning more effectively by allowing us to adjust more nimbly our model as we learn, to adjust what we represent in one tradition, say, system dynamics modeling versus another, say, at an individual level, agent-based modeling, and lets us weave in discrete event simulation where, where desired. It's become a, a lot easier in the past 20 years, and any logic per its name was, was really a big impetus for it, but now it's spread to many other packages. But the truth is it's still encumbered by gaps and things that don't work together that great, um, awkwardness and interoperability, um, and, and high, high computational burden, like where you have uh, stocks and flows within an agent. It, it can be quite expensive. Um, even when you make some efforts to make it less, less expensive. And in my view, there's some new formalisms needed there um, and some additional support on the performance side. Now, uh, I want to talk about in the next two items, you know, an issue near and dear to my heart and near and dear to our work. For 30 years now, I've known and been intrigued by the, the potential for data-driven science and, and, um, and data science more broadly. That was not a term when I learned it. When I took my first uh, machine learning class, it was in 1992. So that would be 30 years ago now. And it wasn't called machine learning. It was like pattern, machine intelligence and pattern recognition or something like that. And you know, since that time, um, coming out of that milieu of AI techniques for pattern recognition and, and for machine intelligence when processing data um, came advances that we know today is the machine learning revolution and, and aspects of big data. And I, I wanna talk about these components and I wanna, I want to fit them into a broader picture. And if this has a tutorial feel, it's because I think it merits some words uh, before the class closes. So agent-based modeling is, I find, not infrequently. It's quite, it's at least once a year or something, I find people treating it as an AI method. And I find it again and again. If people want to say, you know, agent-based math, agent-based modeling is a type of AI, and with due respect, it ain't a type of AI. <laughs> Sorry, uh, it's um, it's not a type of machine learning, but it is related to them. Um, probably, if we think about the landscape of modern computational modeling techniques of note. That includes agent-based modeling and the system science and dynamic modeling sort of oblong uh, ellipse, this kind of blue one stretching across, but it includes many other components, AI, uh, issues having to do with data science and, and, and elements of big data. And I, I wanna situate these a little bit for each other. I think it's worth talking about because there is overlap. There are some system science and dynamic modeling uses that get into machine learning, as some people here know. There's also many uses outside of that. There are some that, in, that are in the data science side. I, I, would, I would say that quite a bit of, of uh, age-based modeling actually does fall in data science sphere, um, the sphere of, of 
building up tools for dealing with very large volumes of data and securing insight from that data. Um, so there is overlap, but if not, it isn't defined by being an, an, an artificial intelligence. The first thing I want to talk about artificial intelligence. The first thing I want to talk about though is big data. And big data here um, is a uh, is a, a topic of of great significance that has a lot of hype associated with it, but there's some truth there. And broadly, I, I like uh, Google's definition of the four V's of big data. It's defined by vo by volume. That's the big of big data, but it's also defined by velocity, variety, and veracity. Um, that it it often will physically measure, for example, some things more reliably than you'd get them through self-report, maybe because people get tired of giving self-report after a while, or there's confabulation of it. So, you know, uh, we're surrounded, we're deluged these days by, by data. And you can argue with some, with some realism that it's, it's a bit of a data glut. And so, whether it's you know LinkedIn or or you know Snapchat or or you know YouTube uh, or you know apps being downloaded or stories being shared on Instagram or, or what have you, um, there's just massive amounts of data that's being contributed within the electronic world, and our physical world also has. Has lots of data. Our, our, our very cell phones collecting data, you know, on a, from accelerometers and data from GPS and and data about our contact with Wi-Fi endpoints, etc. And in the health sphere, there's a large part of this big data that's of direct relevance: search queries, social media posts, data from environmental sensors for nitrous oxides and sulfur dioxides and, and you know, particulate matter, but also weather, cold matters for health, in case no one didn't notice today. Um, uh, the point of sale records, you know, lab data results, electronic health records, admin data, um, even things like incoming and outgoing calls reflect, you know, socialization data and mobility data from cell phones uh, has formed the subject of, of great amounts of inquiry from ourselves and, and from many others. So, you know, big data is, is tied in with, with health issues um, in a big way. It can inform us a lot about health issues and one need look no longer, uh, no further than venerable administrative data to realize how much, you know, really uh, large volume of high velocity data can be very useful. Although I think it's really stretching it whether that really forms big data in many cases. Um, well, why care about this big data and, and, and public health? Well, the truth is a lot of what we see electronically is both a reflection of and an influence on health behaviors, uh, knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. And you know what's going on 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 Instagram or what's going on on Snapchat or what's going on on Facebook or what's going on in YouTube ends up mattering for people's belief with vaccine hesitancy, health knowledge, attitudes and beliefs, risk perception, um, you know, uh, in terms of risk of, of mental health issues, even things like bullying and aggression and harassment and, uh, and domestic violence these days can be mediated by, by online cyber uh, cyber sources, right? Um, and uh, what we see online is again both the reflection of what's going on and harassment and victimization, et cetera, with online trolls, but it's also a driver to what's going on in the world in a really big way, and. You know, if if we're in public health and we're seeking to counter message it, we we need to know about this whole world because it's as important in many ways, particularly for young people, as particulate exposure and you know exposure to to environmental environmental contaminants, etc. 
And there's a natural synergy here between big data and dynamic models. Dynamic models um, can help make sense of that data, can help reason about the processes giving rise to it, can help fill in the gaps there, can help make sense of it, can help explain what's driving it, and can help understand where it might be going, for example. Now, data science is, as a field, driven by this need to, to use and handle and secure insight from big data. And it really consists of mechanism, processes, principles, practices, and infrastructure tools and methods for manipulating this data. And it's seeking to, to, to have effective and efficient use of this data in the world. And machine learning and agent-based modeling are both techniques for doing that within the data science envelope. Um, and they have some measure of overlap. So data science consists of all these different components, many of which are not machine learning, but are supportive of efficient machine learning and supportive of efficient manipulation of this big data. And one of the consumers for that big data and one of the producers is nature-based modeling. Um, now, uh, data science makes heavy use of pipelines for processing data. Often data flows through many stages and agent-based models not infrequently are placed in these pipelines as a component of consuming some data. Maybe it's data on contact patterns that are observed in the world or it's data on mobility as observed in the world. And the agent-based modeling is using it and outputting data, which might go on and be processed itself in terms of projections, or in terms of visualizations that are produced, et cetera. So how do we use AVMs with this high velocity big data? Well, you know, they have fine-grained representation of agents and environments. Um, and AVMs offer really good opportunities for integrating that data. We can often do so in two real ways. One is um, you, have, you have a feeding of the model with this data. So you have contact patterns coming in or you have geographic mobility being observed from the world. You have particulate matter you know, presence within a city, for example, um, exposure indices within a city you have uh, data from around a given geographic area that might feed into the model and therefore inform its simulation in a way that you would then get results out of the model that would say, what's the implication of those exposures or that mobility or those contact patterns in terms of what we might see for infection spread, for example. But another way is by updating the model this is typically with machine learning algorithms to update it to, to reflect, to better reflect the current situation. Um, and uh, there's a need for better integrating agent-based models into these pipelines. Um, we've done some work with this, but it's an area, it's a frontier. It's it, how do you situate an agent-based model so when it gets new data, it can then simulate further, maybe simulate further in time, or maybe start a simulation from the start, run various scenarios, asking what if questions uh, when this data arrive. Um, and, and then often it can put out data, which is used by later stages of the pipeline. So this is integration with big data. But I'm talking about this general landscape, and now we're going to be talking about this component here with machine learning. So we're going to talk about agent-based modeling and machine learning. Agent-based modeling is not machine learning, but it can overlap with machine learning. Um, and hence this kind of this, this teal um, oblong uh, uh, ellipse goes into the machine learning area. Now, Machine learning are, you know, basically describes methods allowing algorithms to automatically learn from and improve performance based on new data experiences. You train it without a data, it learns better about the patterns in the world. 
It can better classify, it can better describe those patterns. It can better characterize causal connections represented in the connection in, in those uh, in that data. And machine learning is used heavily in other areas of AI. So things like robotics or automated reasoning or natural language processing, image processing, they use machine learning. Uh, machine learning helps us identify patterns underlying uh, with hidden within the data and taking advantage of those patterns. Now, um, there's three broad classes of machine learning algorithms, description, so describing data from the world. Um, um, effectively, you can predict, and which is kind of filling in often classifying information or performing a regression that that guesses a missing value, for example, with in a really educated way. And there's causal prediction in a way that that takes into account causation. Description is a significant part recognizing these sort of underlying structures in the data. And it can be as you know as, as basic as you know clustering and data visualization but it turns out that a lot of modern techniques really try to ask their generative techniques and they try to ask what's generating this what are the latent variables in here and age-based modeling can play a role in that they can play a role in, in representing a generative model why you are seeing this data that age-based model it can be a effective way of explaining where this data comes from um, and, and identifying the, the processes by which it, it, it arises. And generative approaches in machine learning, whether they're Bayesian or connectionist or indeed uh, use agent-based modeling can play a role there, play a role in, in sort of understanding um, why we see this data and what's it, what is it telling us about uh, the underlying system and capturing kind of the essence of the system that's giving rise to it. So you can view HMAS modeling as kind of playing a role in, descri in description of data from the world. Um, just for completeness of uh, prediction within, a, within a, a machine learning context, it's not so much prediction forward in time, although it, in some cases it could be, but rather it's you you give the model a bunch of examples where you know the correct answer, you know an extra piece of information, and then you want it to, to give you a trained way of filling in that missing piece of information that you don't have. So you give it a bunch of examples, say of people who with their symptoms when they present it to the hospital, and you know for them whether or not they passed away in the hospital from COVID-19. And so you have maybe their, their bloods, so data, data from lab results and their symptoms. And you know this for maybe 10,000 people and you come up with a way of finding, a way of classifying whether or not someone is likely to die based on that. Finding the, the set of characteristics that distinguish people, that separate people who do die versus those who don't. You find a kind of a rule, a general rule, a trained function that lets you, given the characteristics of a person and their lab results, upon coming to the hospital, will tell you whether or not they're likely to die. Maybe it's very good at, at predicting it. And then you can apply that to many people where you don't. All you know is they've just presented to the hospital and you can predict is this person at high risk of mortality and maybe work to, to really put a lot of emphasis in, in uh, providing good, timely, careful care for those who might be at, judged at, at high risk. So, so this would be sort of um, prediction. So here we're, we're, we have a bunch of examples where we know the true situation, and we come up with a general rule that given, given just the information we normally have, what will 
what will be the outcome or what will be what's the missing piece of information we want to know in that case whether or not they die so age-based models provide fit into machine learning in a number of ways they provide a strong tool for evaluating and refining machine learning algorithms you can use them as synthetic sources of data and and develop classifiers based on the information that's coming out of an agent-based model where you know the true underlying situation you develop a classifier for that data and you can compare it with the true situation in the model so it's easier than than developing it for the world where you don't know the true underlying situation and the agent-based model you do and you can identify its blind spots under what situations this classifier works well or works doesn't work well this is kind of synthetic ground truth. They serve as a source of data for testing out algorithms, for, for running what in statistics are termed simulation experiments. But agent-based models also offer a way of embedding agent behavioral rules that, that are derived from machine learning. And here um, we have in the simulation model, we have, um, agent rules and we could plug in a rule for agent behavior that we've deduced from machine learning on observed data from the world maybe on mobility patterns for example how people tend to move around a city or how they tend to change their behavior um, involving contact patterns when there's a public health advisory or something like that Maybe we've, we've identified from our data, from our smartphone data on contact patterns. Uh, we identify how that behavior changes in the course of an advisory being issued. And we use that information to train a machine learning algorithm that will figure, okay, given a person with these characteristics, how will they change the behavior? And we put that into the agent-based model as the rule for how that person will behave if there's an advisory issued in the model. And then we 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 uh, we run the model. So here we're using machine learning to kind of fill in the rule of an agent-based model. It's it's a rule derived from a machine learning model. Um, finally, and a very important area of our work for dynamic models in general, and something we have applied for machine learning, but where the, oh, sorry, for agent-based models, where there's a lot more work to be done, is, is you can use machine learning algorithms to reground a model periodically. So you have a model and it has some predictions. You have data from the world that is coming in and you use these techniques to get a consensus understanding about what the situation is now. And, and often your interest is then asking what if questions are predicting forward. So here we're meshing ongoing data from the world with model predictions and correcting our understanding of what the situation is in the model as a distribution. And techniques like particle filtering, particle MCMC play a big role in this. So these are, latent state inference techniques. And basically these are taking a model that you know is fallible, data from the world you know is fallible, and using them to get a whole greater than some of the parts, using them to, to sort of correct model oversights and ground the model in what's actually happened, much as with weather models, you would want a weather model to be used with informed by the latest data same weather model as it was you know as it would have predicted at the beginning of september for the for tomorrow's weather wouldn't offer much value because it hasn't been told about what's happened since and it couldn't reasonably predict that far out without a lot of uncertainty but if it's been grounded to the last you know the last three hours from now um, by data all along the way, that weather model, its predictions for tomorrow are probably pretty good. And I'll tell you, here in Saskatoon, it'll be cold. I can assure you that. So, um, so here, uh, we use these techniques to ground a model. We, we take an agent-based model, 
we have unfolding data from the world, data that's coming in, and we're constantly sort of updating the models, understanding what's going on right now with that data from the world. So we can always ask what if questions and run it forward in a way that's current, in a way that's informed. It'll give us the best understanding of what's likely to happen tomorrow and the next day, just like that weather model informed by the latest weather data will give us that understanding. Okay, um, time is moving on here. So I'll, I'll address a few more of these um, and we'll wrap up. So the computational burden of ABM, as I mentioned, is significant because of at least two big parts. There's lots of two big components. There's many moving parts, many, many agents that whose behavior have to be simulated. And then you got to run the model many times for realizations if it's a stochastic model, which most are. Most are stochastic because they're depicting individual level behaviors, which tend to be stochastic. Um, and you know the truth is this limits learning. It slows learning. It slows our learning cycle. Running the model takes longer. So when we run it, we observe, compare it with what we see from the world, maybe refine the model, run it again. That cycle goes slower because of the the burden and and it you know and it inhibits inhibits our learning. Um, and there's many reasons for this. Uh, one of the big ones is if we have a model with many events, like many messages being sent, or we're building up networks or changing them over time that are really elaborate, um, that can take a lot of time, particularly in something like any logic, which does it needlessly burdensome way. Um, there can be visualizations and outputs of data and statistics we're calculating over the population routinely all the time, which, which take a lot of time. Um, and there can be hybrid performance issues. It turns out that ABM offers some really good opportunities for speeding up um, through parallel processing. Um, and basically, the fact that you have to run the same model many times to get an understanding of its regularities, its orderliness and its output. In fact, we run it one time, we see one thing, run it another time, we see something that kind of is similar, but it's different in its particulars. You run it a third time, we see again, see something that's similar, but different in its particulars, it requires us to run it many times. And those can be run in parallel. We don't have to run it one after the other, after the other, we can run it in parallel. And in fact, you may have seen that any logic in fact does this um, and to its credit, it'll be running them at the same time. It uses your cores uh, and that's good. Um, now, beyond that though, there's also opportunities that are somewhat harder to exploit with between distinct agents. So a given run of the model, say with a million agents, generally speaking, there's some locality in the model that that if you pick a given agent, they're interacting with, not with any agent across the entire model, but with agents somewhat nearby them, maybe then their area of the province, or maybe other agents in their area of the city. Um, they'll tend to be interacting with agents of certain type, maybe their person in a long-term care facility and they act, interact with people in that long-term care facility, but not you know, a person from across town who's driving a truck or something like that. It's, it's, it's limited, it has locality. And given that we can actually speed up if we're clever. And if a model is analyzable, if it can be analyzed, if it's built out of these rules encoded as data, we can we have an opportunity to speed it up more more fully. I had noted before this this issue of decision making in agents and in, in situated agents, agents who are placed, say, in space or in a network. Um, and I mentioned opinion dynamics models, um, uh, of which there are many, and you know, this, this is an area where we've contributed several, several papers, um, uh, one with Kurt Kruger and, 
Kelvin Troy from the US uh, National Institutes of Health. Another one uh, involving Jeff McDonald and Keith Masnick involving um, uh, optometrists and workforce training. But here, um, you know, we're looking at, excuse me, that, that'd be for the second one, um, the random utility theory. The first of them, opinion dynamics, Narja Shojati has done some good work. And uh, some of the work with, uh, with trust has a little bit of a flavor of that. But, um, you know, this characterizing of how people perceive things, come to believe things, and come to decide um, is an area of frontiers with an age based modeling. And the work of Kahneman and Tversky, I mentioned earlier, this two types of thinking, fast and slow. Deliberative thinking, where they weigh the preferences and or the way the choices in light of their preferences, you know, the costs, like you might make a decision between three possible properties you're thinking about buying. Um, you know, this one is much more distant, but it costs a lot less. And uh, it's a newer house. That one is a is a uh, is a is a property that needs a lot of work but it is closer, but you're not sure about the neighborhood and a third one, you know, you, you, you might do a deliberative thinking about that versus um, trying to decide, you know, on a, on a, on a, on a basis very quickly, which, um, you know, which way you're going to, to go to, to go pick up your child in childcare, uh, given that the traffic is bad. You, you might make a you know decision quite quickly based on that. Um, a lot of health decisions may be made, made on that turn of the cuff sort of way day to day, whereas others like this for a cancer treatment might be things you really think about carefully. Um, Age-based modeling process. Um, I'm a big believer in the idea of uh, drawing on techniques from from software development methods and agile software development, I think has a lot of, lot of opportunities for learning um, for techniques that can be applied for effective modeling, embedding with stakeholders, quick turnaround, getting stakeholder feedback, um, make, having short sprints and, and getting reprioritization and setting aside for some agile processes, explicit time for refactoring, for, for updating the model to remove unnecessary things and, and, uh, and really improve the structure of it. Um, agile approaches provide us with ways of doing that. And finally, having these model languages, which I showed earlier, model mapping languages for engaging with stakeholders is, is I think, uh, important. And um, I will say, you know, there's a need for improved, process, uh, improved tools for teams. Um, and, and, you know, I think um, some of these are process uh, efforts, things like having in place uh, issue tracking and pull requests and using version control. Um, that in a way that's increasingly also being applied to machine learning, um, but also having traceability and being able to say like these results came from this version of the model with this model parameter assumptions is really important. Um, and then having some way of testing models is a real point of need that's, that's less supported in today's environment. Um, I'm the, I'm uh, a big believer that modeling, modeling approaches going forward really need to recognize that agent-based modeling is conducted in teams. Impactful models almost inevitably come from interdisciplinary teams. Um, models that really uh, are useful and get used come from teams that can speak to the needs of many different types of stakeholders. And to support these teams, you need to support um, team interaction around models because models are boundary objects where many parties can interact around them, can, can interact with them. And uh, 
we have long prioritized having real-time collaborative interaction around models in the same way around a Google Doc document, you can have real-time collaboration to shape that document. You could have that around model. Running the model, um, annotating the model, modifying the model, discussing the model, um, uh, and uh, sort of commenting on it and interpreting results and adding those interpretations, et cetera. Um, there, there really should be, and this is part of our technical vision, a way that different users can kind of see the components of the model they're interested in. And so if there's someone who's an expert in, in, in diabetes, they might want to see the diabetes components of the model, or someone who's an expert in smoking, they want to see those components of the model, zero in on those components, see those components highlighted so they can give feedback on them, rather than having it tangled with, with all the rest. Um, and uh, in some way of discussing model output also uh, very important. Okay, um, so those are my comments on some modeling frontiers, and I want to provide in, in the, the very final couple minutes here just um, some, some further resources. Um, so there's some opportunities for further classroom education. Um, and uh, I mentioned here, um, so this was actually for my... Uh, from my uh, boot camp, I originally created the slide, so this was still in the future here. Of course, uh, this is transpired now. But um, conversely, my summer boot camp um, is uh, is something that some of you might want to consider. Um, of all the decisions I made about this uh, course, probably the one I most regret now is not having lab sessions every week for students to explore. Uh, hands-on modeling. And uh, that was something I chose chose not to do because I recognized the diversity of needs with respect to different model platforms. And I wasn't sure how to best handle that. But in retrospect, I I should have uh, I should have uh, committed to having lab sessions, even if it meant having a version of them for for any logic and and for net logo at the same time. Um, so you can pick. It would require a lot of work, but it, was, it would be the right thing to do when my next version of this course, which I'll be, I'm sure, offering within the next year or two. Um, Scott Page of University of Michigan and head of the Center for Complex Systems there offers a model thinking course. I've heard a lot of good things about it. I know Scott very well, um, and uh, I'm honored to have, have, uh, have him um, uh, follow some of our work. Um, Scott's uh, course on Coursera is uh, not specific to agent-based models, but it it draws on insights from agent-based models for sure. It's really focused on on how modeling can inform thinking about the world in a in a broader way. It's not health only, um, although some of its contents do inform understanding of health. Um, in a few weeks, in one month, I'll be offering you know a, a more general dynamic modeling class where I have system dynamics modeling, discrete event simulation, and agent-based modeling. And much of that course is is on those uh, of the system dynamics components, particularly. Um, so possibly some will be interested. Volker Grimm um, in California. Um, offers a week-long course uh, at Humboldt State University um, uh, on agent-based modeling in NetLogo. And uh, I've also heard good things about that course. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I, I am offering boot camps, and there will be several boot camps um, this coming summer. I'm thinking about offering one that's an intermediate level modeling one rather than a basic modeling one, but they are focused on model building and they come with incubators and uh, we're, we're going to be, again, pairing them up with a hackathon. Um, 
For those interested in, in you know, working with students, I would mention that we have class projects where students are looking for stakeholders to work with. And if, you know, if any of you are interested in working with student teams there, um, you know, uh, that is a way to, to try out model ideas further. Um, uh, my lab, needless to say, works with a lot of parties on, on the, the modeling area, and I'm always glad to, to explore, things, uh, explore things there. Um, Finally, um, especially my comments here on data science and and, and uh, on big data and on machine learning, there's a course where I really go into this relationship uh, between system science and data science and the synergies um, that can exist there and talk a lot about these techniques for bringing together Simulation modeling tools like agent-based modeling, together with with machine learning tools and big data and data science, um, and some of the techniques we explore are, are listed here. And we're going to be adding one related to derivation of model governing equations, um, which which draws on deep learning approaches as well. So if anyone's interested in this interface between dynamic modeling on the one hand and data science, uh, including machine learning, including AI, et cetera, this, this might, be, might be of interest for you. Okay, um, so those are all the comments I have right now. Um, it's uh, 12 o'clock here. And uh, I, uh, I wanna thank all of you for your uh, contributions to the course, uh, for your uh, for your uh, you know bearing with the many disruptions, uh, fire alarms, and uh, uh, issues with uh, connection problems and audio problems and um, and uh, host host issues uh, on here. Um, and bearing with a, a course where we had to cover a lot of a lot of material um, and uh, where there was simultaneous need for building up practical skills to deliver on projects with tools and at the same time following this conceptual structure within um, the broader context of ABM. Um, I hope the course has offered some value. Um, I know for many of you, you're in the thick of your projects and I am very much looking forward to helping you bring them home for soft landings and help them live up to their potential in the next few weeks here. So um, I think with those comments, I'm going to stop my lecture um, and I will switch over to the first of the post formal class uh, uh, office hours, um, which will be continuing for another two weeks. Um, I would finally note, um, as I said, I'm planning to give that final lecture on equitable modeling, and I'll let you know when that is. If possible, I'm going to try to do it by the holidays. Okay. Thank you very much, and I hope to see many of you in office hours. <laughs>